Father, we thank you so much for what you've done for us, that you sent life, you sent your son because you loved us so much and you gave the whole world the provision of your grace and that all who would call upon you would be saved. And so thank you, Father, as, as we who are gathered together, the ones who have called and are calling upon you, come, Lord Jesus. We thank you for feeding us with your Holy Spirit, feeding us with your life, feeding us with your word, the bread of life, that we can know you and know you through your word. So Holy Spirit, uh, fill us with your teaching, the great teacher, the one who shows us uh, the, the inspired words and that, that each one would hear what the Holy Spirit would speak to you. I believe that. We, op- we come with the expectant ears to hear, open hearts, and, um, and just an amazing uh, in awe of what our King has done and is continuing to do. So, Father, speak through me that my lips might be pleasing to you and that our hearts would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So uh, we're continuing through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 25. So if you have your Bibles, open up with me to Acts chapter 25. Now, it's my intention that we are going to get through the entire book or the entire chapter of Acts 25. Normally, we don't do that. Um, in this case, I think, I think we will. I think we have a good opportunity to. It's a narrative, and we're seeing, uh, again, Paul coming, um, standing before another governor, uh, Governor Festus. And we are going to see what, what's taking place. So really, we're going to be looking at chapter 25 today. Uh, next week, we'll be getting into 26 when he stands again against, uh, uh, among Festus and Agrippa. So this time, we're going to see him stand uh, before uh, this governor, Governor Festus. And what we're going to see here is Paul's appeal to Caesar, And in that, what we're going to, uh, what I was getting out of this and what I was seeing God doing here is God is orchestrating the circumstances uh, among Paul's life providentially, right? I keep using that word, God's providential hand. We're seeing God providentially working, not against people's will, but with with people's free will, good and bad. He's working among them um, and, and providentially working with his ambassador, and getting the way for him to go to Rome. And he's going to go to Rome, and he's going to do some amazing things in Rome. And so this is what we're starting to see. Remember back, um, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but Jesus promised that Paul would go to Rome. And this is now the makings of that. This is God's providence on Paul's life, bringing Paul to Rome. And it begins with Paul's appeal to Caesar. So we left off last week as we finished up chapter 24, And we left off in verse 27, um, where Paul was bound and imprisoned in Caesarea for two whole years. And we talked about what that was like. You know, the Bible doesn't talk much about what was happening during those two years, but we saw that um, Felix was making it very hard on Christians, uh, and um, and he was just a terrible governor in in um, in that respect. And you read Josephus, and you see uh, the violence that he portrayed among those two years, um, all because he was prideful. You know, he left Paul bound in in Caesarea because of his greed and because of his pride. Um, But during that time, we know Paul is hanging on to the promise that he heard from Jesus, that just as you have uh, bore witness of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness for me in Rome. And that's the promise that he's holding on to. And remember what he starts off those words? He says, take courage, Paul, right? Be of good cheer or take courage. You know, Jesus knew that Paul was going to be bound for two years, but, um, but he never lost hope. Never once do you see him mad at God. He's just hanging hanging on to the hope of the promise. And the, the, the ultimate hope that we see in Paul's teachings is the hope of everlasting life, the hope of resurrection life unto with to be with Jesus forever. So Paul, he knows that he's going to Rome. Um, he just doesn't know how and he doesn't know when. But here in this chapter, we're going to see that light starts to come, starts to shine, and he starts seeing an avenue on how he's actually going to get to Rome. Different than what he thought, right? You know, he probably thought he was getting to Rome just like he has all other places, uh, getting on a ship of his own free will and going. But this time he's getting on a ship and he's going to be transferred over to Rome as a prisoner, right? And, and he probably would have never guessed that, but, but he knows he's going to Rome. So let's go ahead just to get right into it. We've got kind of a lot of verses to cover, 27 verses. So we'll just start in verse one. 
And we'll start going verse by verse. So verse one, he says, now when Festus had come to the province, after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So again, we see a change in governorship. We see in verse 27 of chapter 24, it says, but after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix and Felix wanting to do the Jews a favor left Paul bound. So we see Porcius Festus, he takes governorship after two years of Paul being in, uh, bound in Caesarea and Porcius Festus comes and he takes governorship. Now this is in 60 AD. So, and, and that, it's really fun because as you look at the history, this becomes a very mi major milestone for dating the Apostle Paul's life. You had 44 AD, which is whenever King Agrippa uh, the first died because he got eaten by worms, struck by God and eaten by worms. Um, that was in 44. That's a, that's a very critical milestone in, in uh, not just Christian history, but actually um, secular history, Roman history. We know that so we can, we can date things. This is another one in 60 AD, when Festus takes over, that's agreed by most all scholars that this happened in 60 AD. So it's kind of fun as you're laying out the chronology. I keep telling you about the dates that we're dealing with here, um, and, and it's built by these parameters that we're seeing in history. So it's 60 AD. Paul, I mean, uh, so Paul is in, um, in Caesarea bound. Festus becomes the new governor of Judea, and Festus arrives in Caesarea, um, coming from Rome, having been appointed by Nero himself. Himself. That's how these, these governors were appointed. Um, he was a, a procreator is what they call it. So he, become, he comes to Caesarea, but notice he's only in Caesarea for three days. Let me actually turn my pin on. And this is interesting, and this kind of gives you a flavor for the whole chapter. He's only in Caesarea for three days, and then he, he ends up going to Jerusalem. So why does he go to Jerusalem? He doesn't hang out in Caesarea more than three days. The reason why he goes to Jerusalem so fast is because that's the heartbeat of Judea. This is the capital of Judea. It's where the chief priests, the elders of the Jewish faith are here in Jerusalem. So he needs to go down to Jerusalem because that's where all the action is, right? Whenever you're governor of Judea, your main focus is Jerusalem. And so that's why he goes down down to Jerusalem after only three days. Now, what's interesting is, um, you know, Nero recalled Felix. Felix lost his position as governorship over Judea because he was such a terrible man that even Nero himself, even Rome itself, could not tolerate what Felix was doing. And you read Josephus and you see the terrible corruption that he was doing, really bad stuff. So Nero himself recalls uh, Felix from the office and appoints Festus. So now that's where we begin. So being his duty, goes down to Jerusalem, Festus does, and he begins talking with the leaders of the Jews, the high priests, the Sanhedrists, the chief, the chief elders of the city. And his first order of business is to get acquainted with the affairs of the city. And of course, the entire city is, is Jewish, right? It's a, it's a Jewish, I mean, that they're governed by Jewish law. This is, this is the heartbeat of the city. And he quickly realizes the struggles of Jewish politics. Very quickly, there's a Jewish politics in what the Jews were doing. Constantly, we see the Jews are working with politics to get their way. And we've seen that all through the book of Acts. Because the Jews, we see and we found that they are very demanding people in the, in the first century. They, were, uh, they would use political means to get just what they wanted. We saw that all through uh, the book of Acts. And, and they're such hypocrites because they would blame you know, uh, Peter and Paul and these other guys, uh, Barnabas, right, for eating with pagan Gentiles. But yet they themselves, if it served their purpose, they would start working with pagan Romans uh, who, who were so terrible and full of debauchery, but they would start working with them to get their way, start making uh, ideas and, and, and melding themselves with these, these Romans, these Roman political means, so that they could get just what they wanted, um, so that they could murder the Apostle Paul. You just talk about the hypocrisy that was going on. I mean, Jesus talked about that extensively. So, so here we see another 
another element of hypocrisy where these Jews, wanting to take advantage of this situation, start working with Festus, just like they were doing with Felix. I believe Felix was taking bribes from the Jews during that two years. I think now the Jews are trying to use this now to their advantage with the new governor coming into place. So, uh, so Paul, uh, held in prison by Felix, wanting to do, do the Jews a favor, now we see the same thing. Festus is even going to say those words, wanting to do the Jews a favor, he's doing some things. And it really gets him in a lot of trouble. And we see that. And it's all because of the demanding uh, per persistence of these Jews trying to use this as an opportunity to kill the Apostle Paul. That's ultimately what we're seeing. So we're seeing the plotting of the Jews. So uh, we'll continue in verses two and three. Then the high priest, so um, Festus has now come down to Jerusalem and he's talking to these high priests. It says, then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul. And they positioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lie in ambush along the road to kill him. So again, just another plot. It just shows that even after two years, they never forgot about the apostle Paul, right? And they have this hatred that's just boiling for this apostle. Uh, and they want, it, they want him dead. They, they tried four times uh, previous while Paul was in Jerusalem. Um, uh, but they weren't successful. God in his providence saved Paul's life. Um, but these Jews are constantly trying to kill the apostle Paul. And you remember, even during the two years, we read in Hebrews chapter 10 about what these Jews were doing to, to Jewish Christians who have come to the faith, who were enlightened, and they were identifying as a Christian going up to Caesarea to visit Paul in his chains. And it said that during that time, these unbelieving Jews were ransacking their houses, plundering their goods, um, because they, they had identified themselves as a Christian and they had compassion on Paul in his chains. We read that. That's how we ended last week in Hebrews chapter 10, right? So that's what was happening during these two years, uh, complete hatred against Paul. Now, Paul is in protective custody in Caesarea, so they can't get in to kill him, but they can do a lot of other bad things to Christians who identify or Jews who identify as Christians. And as soon as they see an opportunity that they might be able to get Paul out of custody, and capitalize it, they want to try and do that and kill him. So notice it says, well, they're going to lie in ambush along the road to kill him. They're going to try and get Festus to bring Paul out of custody from Caesarea, bring him down to Jerusalem. And so I've got a map here. You remember at the very beginning, two years ago, um, to, uh, they were trying to, there was that plot in Jerusalem to try and kill the Apostle Paul. They were going to, the Jews, they, there was 40 men that had taken a vow, and they were trying to take Paul out from the Antonian fortress, bring him over to the Sanhedrin council near the temple. And during that time, they would lie in ambush to kill him. That was their plot. God's providence uh, thwarted that. And so then uh, the commander Lysias, he hears about this, right, from Paul's nephew, and, um, and he escorts Paul all the way up to Caesarea, but not just himself, right? 470 Roman soldiers go with Paul, escorting him up. That's the danger that Lysias saw. So now the Jews say, well, they don't know about what happened with our plots to kill him. They don't know any of that. Um, it's, he's only been in office for three days. Chances are Festus doesn't know about how Lysias gave him 470 men to protect him. So he says, let's get him to come back from Caesarea, come back down to Jerusalem. And Festus, not really knowing all the circumstances, he's only going to have a few people surrounding him, escorting him, and we can easily ambush him and kill him on the way. That's their plan. You can just see this hatred that they have for the Apostle Paul. So now verses four and five, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. So Festus has a better head on his shoulders, it seems like. It seems like he's more level-headed and he doesn't know this man, Paul, but he isn't ready to release a prisoner, especially a Roman citizen, until he has some more information, until he's actually met Paul himself. So he's not going to he's not going to be persuaded by these Jews at least yet. So then verse 5, therefore he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. So Festus isn't planning on staying in Jerusalem for very long. We find out he only stays there 10 days. And then he says, he says, come back with me. Notice he's going to come, they're going to come with him. He says, come with me, with me, pick up some, uh, get some uh, men of authority of your Jews who can try him. And if there's anything 
uh, of fault, if there's anything atop us, anything out of place, if there's anything amiss, go ahead and accuse him, but we need to do it in Caesarea where he is and where my judgment seat is. I'm not going to do it in Jerusalem. So Festus actually starts off very well here. He takes a stance against the persistence of the Jews, and he says, no, we're not going to do what you want. We're going to go ahead and go up to Caesarea, and that's where we're going to have uh, the meeting. We're going to have the trial. He's getting promises him a formal trial. So verse 6 then, and when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. So there we see the judgment seat. Um, This is a formal trial, and this is what he promised the Jews that he would do. Notice the hastiness of this whole situation. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat. So he stays in Jerusalem for 10 days, gets up to Caesarea, and the next day, you know... I can just imagine the Jews were probably like, okay, we're here, let's do this. The, the persistence, the, the, the overbearing demanding of the Jews is why he does this the next day. So he gives in to them and he says the very next day, Festus calls the trial, he sits on his judgment seat and he calls Paul to be brought in. So you kind of picture the scenario, they're in the judgment hall, formal trial, you got Festus on his judgment seat, that word judgment is actually the word bema seat, same word that we see with our judgment that we're going to have with Christ. Um, It's just a, a, this is a formal trial. So Festus on his judgment seat, we have Paul standing before him and we have the Jews waiting to make their accusations, the false accusations. So if you think about this, Paul has been bound in Caesarea for two years, knowing that he's going to be going to Rome. But all of a sudden now, he doesn't really know exactly all the scenarios. He's in prison. He has some liberties, but he's still in prison. And now he sees, he gets the call that he has to come and stand before this new governor, Festus, and give his testimony. And I just thought of 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Right? Paul, I mean, for two years, he's waiting. And, he, and, he's, and of course, uh, Felix was coming in and out. But for two years, now he gets the call that now he's got to stand before the judgment seat again. And he sure is ready, right? Now, I just want to read something to you because First Peter 3, whenever you read the context around it, it describes exactly what's going on with Paul. And I thought it was very interesting. I'm just going to read it to you. 1 Peter 3.13. He says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Notice the context of what Peter's writing that. You know, a lot of times we as American Christians, we're, we say, okay, be ready to give a, a defense for everyone that asks you a question, like you're in a, a restaurant and, and somebody sees you reading the Bible and be ready to tell them about your faith, right? Um, those are really good things and that's what we should be doing. The context of this is what Peter's saying is those people who want to harm you and kill you for reading your Bible and, and be, being open about your faith, that's when you're, you are to be ready to be, give a defense for why you believe in the gospel, for the hope that is in you. And many Christian martyrs died professing that, right? Professing that the, these, the Roman Empire, especially with Nero, and then we go on to the, the later emperors in the first century, you know, if they found out you were a Christian, they would kill you and they would tell you recant or else you'll be killed. And so it's the same thing here. I mean, he's, it, it's this, this, this pressure, you know, there's a pressure around him. You know, Paul, but Paul being who he is, faithful, he gives this reason for the hope that is in him. And I'm just going to continue reading. He says in verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. That's exactly what these Jews are doing. They're trying to defame Paul as being an evildoer, not as just being a Christian, but they're trying to defame him as an evildoer. And we're going to see that in their accusations. We've already seen that in times past. Okay. So verse seven, he says, when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. 
So this is basically a repeat from two years ago. They got nothing new. There's no new accusations. There's no new evidence to their claims. All they have is that there's this new governor and they're hoping that this new governor can be swayed by their accusations and they can actually kill the apostle Paul. So it says, but they could not prove. They laid many serious complaints against Paul. Now those serious complaints, he doesn't list out the exact complaints that they're bringing, but it has to be very similar to what they did two years ago. Remember two years ago, they said that he was a plague, a creator of dissension, a heretic, and, a pro, and he also profaned the temple. Those are the accusations coming against Paul. You know they're probably saying the same exact thing, but it's the same outcome. They could not prove, which they could not prove. They had no evidence. They had no witnesses. All these things are things they're just making up. They're false accusations. So then verse 8. We, f- we find that Paul stands up and he answers for himself again, two years later, while he answered for himself, ne- and this is what he said, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. So he's saying the same thing. I, ha- I, have, I stand in good conscience before God and before man that I haven't done anything that they're accusing me of. I haven't done anything against the Jews, their law, or their temple. I haven't done any of that. But he adds one more thing. Notice this is different than what he said two years ago. He says, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. And I think he throws that in because they're attacking him, not just as a Christian, but as, a, as an enemy of Rome. This is how they're really trying to get, this is how they can persuade Festus to kill Paul, um, is if they, if they can persuade him that Paul is an enemy of Rome. That's what they're trying to do. That's the whole motive behind everything. Um, so the Jews trying to pronounce this, uh, but Paul says, I haven't done anything to offend Caesar. I haven't done anything to stand uh, against Rome itself. I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a good conscience toward God and man, Jews and Rome itself. But something that Luke doesn't record, I'm just going to flip back to Acts again, something that Luke doesn't record but we know that he says it because it's something that Festus brings up later when he's talking to Agrippa, is we know that Paul preached the gospel. And I love that over here because look at, look at what he says in verses 18 and 19. This is Festus now talking to Agrippa, talking about this, um, this trial that, that he's in the process of. And notice what it says in verse 18. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions about him, uh, against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. I love those words. Nowhere do we, does Luke record that Paul preached the gospel, that Jesus died and was risen from the dead, but there Festus is saying, this is what his defense was. He says, I didn't bring, I didn't bring up anything. He didn't bring up anything of, of the things that I supposed, right? But what he did say is they had some questions about this Jesus who had died and Paul says that he's alive. Paul was saying that Paul preached Jesus and him crucified and him risen from the dead everywhere he went. And this is what he's saying before Festus. I think it's fun just seeing all that. So Festus had a choice right here. After being on the judgment seat, he has a choice. Does he, after seeing all the facts, after seeing the accusations come against him, is he going to let him go or is he going to try and do the Jews a favor? And he, he, we find that he's going to do the Jews a favor and it gets them in a real bad mess. But what he should have done has been more like Gallio. I'm just going to flip over here in Acts 25. Listen to how Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, listen to how he dealt with these Jews. These Jews have been overbearing. I mean, this is how they are through the book of Acts. But notice how, how whenever the Jews confronted Gallio about this man, Paul, notice how he responded. Uh, This is in 2518. When the accusers, I'm sorry, not 2518, 1812. We just read that. (laughs) 1812, um, back in in chapter 18, he's standing up with uh, Gallio, proconsul of Achaia. And notice what it says. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that's Greece, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So it's the same scenario here. These Jews are bringing Paul to the judgment seat in Greece, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth 
Notice what Gallio says. Gallio interrupted Paul and said to the Jews, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. That's actually how... Festus should have responded. That's how Felix should have responded. That's how Festus should have responded. Gallio was a strict man. He did. He just put him in their place. He didn't let those Jews uh, persuade him. Festus, on the other hand, we see that he's got some type of an obligation. And I can, I can sympathize with the guy. I mean, it, it's actually really heartbreaking when you're, I've been studying this all week and I've been seeing the dilemma that Festus is in because here he's governor of Judea. He's got to deal with these people. And so he wants to do them a favor because he's going to be ruling over them. And they're a very unruly bunch, right? Um, but he also knows this man's guilty or this man's innocent and, and he's not guilty of anything. So how does he respond? You know, it's, it's tough. If he would have just said, hey, go away. I don't want to hear it. He should have said those things. But wanting to do the Jews a favor, this is verse nine. But Festus, this is where it all goes wrong for Festus. Wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? What did, Fe what did Festus think was going to be different in Jerusalem versus Caesarea? I mean, so all he's doing is wanting to do the Jews a favor. They originally wanted him to come down from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He didn't know about the ambush, but he's trying to appease them, trying to placate them. Um, and really, I think his head is spinning. I think he's not thinking very clearly, and he's trying to appease these guys. So he asked Paul this question, are you willing to go up? Um, and this result, the result of this gets him into a really big mess. And we're going to see Paul's response. So verses 10 and 11, this is Paul responding. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Okay, this is where they are. They're in front of, they're at a formal trial and he's standing at the Bama seat of Caesar and Festus is now the governor, right? Where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I'm an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there's nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. So he says, I, if I truly did something wrong and deserving of death, I would admit it and I would die. I would die. He's not scared of dying, but he's like, I haven't done anything deserving of death or these chains. And now he's being forced. He knows that he can see Festus wavering and he knows the dangers of going back to Jerusalem. He knows these men want to kill him. And so, and he knows he's going to be going to Rome. So he's, he knows his laws. He knows the Roman laws. And so he says, he's kind of like, I can see Festus wavering. I'm going to step in and I'm going to appeal to Caesar because that's how I'm going to get to Rome. And I'm not going to go back to Jerusalem because he could see that about, he was about ready to go back to Jerusalem or they were trying to get him to go back there. And he knew the dangers of going back there. So notice what he says. He says, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. He's saying Caesar's judgment seat because this is where uh, the governing authority of Caesar was in Judea. That's that's uh, Festus, right? And this is where I ought to be judged. As a Roman citizen, having done nothing wrong, this is where I ought to be judged. And he's been in protective custody for the past two years, and he knows he's safe here. So notice this in verse 11. This, this thing that he says, this statement, he says, no one can deliver me to them. So Paul knows his rights as a Roman citizen. And he, in this verse 11, he actually implements two rights that a Roman citizen has. The first one is, no one can deliver me to these Jews in Jerusalem. And that's an interesting statement that he says, no one can deliver. He's, tell, he's telling Festus, you can't deliver me against my will down to Jerusalem. That's a pretty bold statement for a servant to say, for a, uh, for a prisoner to say to Festus, right? But he's right in that. No one can deliver me to them. I, I'm an uncondemned Roman and you can't force me to go get, have a trial somewhere else. This is where I ought to be judged. And just to show that, notice Festus's uh, language here. Look at 25.9. If you look at how Festus words these things. So 25.9, notice what he just said. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a, a favor, asked Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged? See, 
Festus couldn't do anything against this Roman citizen's will. Are you willing to do this? Because I can't force you as a Roman citizen. I, I, I'm, I, you, you're an uncondemned Roman, but if you agree to it, I'll take you down to Jerusalem. And then he says the same thing when he's talking to Agrippa in verse 20. He says, this is Festus talking to Agrippa about this trial. He says, and because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and be judged concerning these matters. So again, are you, were, was Paul willing? Paul's like, I'm not willing. I'm not going down to Jerusalem. They're going to try and kill me. So therefore I appeal to Caesar. So he says, no one can deliver me to them. And then his next uh, his next right that he implements is his appeal to see Caesar. Seeing that Festus is wavering, knowing that there's really no other out here from what he can tell, he pulls out his trump card that every Roman citizen had, and he says, I appeal to Caesar. So every Roman citizen, every uncondemned Roman citizen had the right to this appeal. But not everyone was authorized to go up and stand before Caesar. And this is where some people get it a little bit wrong. They think just because he was a Roman citizen, he could say willy nilly, I appeal to Caesar and anybody could go. But this is Caesar Nero. This is the emperor of the entire Roman empire. Not just anyone is gonna come stand before Nero. Not, it's not gonna happen. So he has this right to appeal, but it has to go through some channels for it to be approved for him to go up to appeal to Caesar. And that's what we see in, this next, in the next verse. But notice these words, what he says. He says, I appeal to Caesar. It's Caesara Epicolumi. And it actually means Caesar I call upon. It's an, kind of an interesting thing. I, I appeal to Caesar, but he's, he's really calling upon Caesar. He's calling upon his rights as a Roman citizen. So notice what Festus does after he does it. He doesn't grant him this appeal right away. Notice what Festus does. Verse 12, then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, I think that's very interesting because it shows, okay, Festus is the judge here and he's got this Roman citizen that's uncondemned and, and he says, I appeal to Caesar. That's what every Roman citizen had a right to, but now it's his um, his, his objective on whether he's going to allow that appeal to go through. So Festus comes back and he goes and he confers with his council. Now this word council is not Sanhedrin. It's not the Sanhedrin council. This is his own Roman council that he now uh, has, has at his disposal. And I think he probably confers with the council because Paul, uh, F Festus is kind of um, at a loss. He doesn't know what he's doing, what he should do here. So now he's got this wild card where he's appealed to Caesar. How is he going to handle this? And I just sympathize with the with with Festus here. As I'm reading this, I just can't help but feel sorry for this guy because Festus is in a very hard predicament. Just like we said, he should have just took the stance and said, no, I'm not going to listen to you. But he's in between a rock and a hard place here. So if you remember the, the, the persistence of the Jews within three days, you know, of being in, in Caesarea, of taking office, the Jews are already on him. And, they're then, and ever since then, they've been at him. You know, as soon as they get to Caesarea, the next day they hold this trial. You can see the persistence and de the demanding of the Jews. Um, really, it's this overbearing uh, persistence. And what's happening is I think the Jews are guilting Festus into making this decision. So he comes back out from conferring with his council and notice what he says. You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. These are Festus's words from the judgment seat. He could have, he has a decision. He could have said, no, Paul, I, I, uh, I'm going to judge you as innocent and, and there's no more case. Just like Gallio said, just leave. There's nothing that I can judge you on. He could have said that and he should have said that. But instead, probably with his head spinning and not thinking really clearly, he says, okay, you've appealed to Caesar. All right, to Caesar, you shall go. And this is a mistake from Festus's point. He should not have done this. And we actually see the rest of the chapter, him trying to dig himself out of this mess. The fact that he allowed, Fest, uh, that he allowed Paul to have this appeal to Caesar. So now he's got a big problem on his hands. And the big problem is this. Paul is innocent. 
and there's nothing that's charged against him. So what is Festus going to do by sending Paul up to Nero, his God, his Lord, right? That's what Festus, that's the way he looked at Nero. He's got to send his, this uncondemned Roman who has nothing charged against him to stand before his Lord. How do you think Nero is going to respond to Festus? Festus just took over this governorship and he's like, what are you thinking, man? You know, you, you can't be just sending the, anybody up here. You know, I'm, I'm God. You worship me. This is what Nero is saying. These guys had a huge complex, right? So you can't just send anybody up to me. So Festus is really in trouble now because he's legally appealed. He's legally let Paul appeal to Caesar, but now he can't send him up there until he has something that he can send an accusation with. With. So Festus now, for the rest of the chapter, we're going to see him kind of backpedaling, grasping at straws, trying to figure out how is he going to send Paul up to, uh, up to Caesar. So verse 13, after some days, King, oh, did I miss something? Oh no, we'll, we'll talk about that. So after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. So notice this, after some days, Festus is now trying to figure out how he's going to send Paul up to Nero. Some days have gone by, probably a few weeks, okay? And he doesn't really have anything to, to charge against Paul. So he's just waiting for something to happen. So in the meantime, King Agrippa and Bernice come to Caesarea to greet Festus. Now, the reason why King Agrippa is coming to Caesarea is to honor Festus for this new governorship of Judea. And the reason why is because King Agrippa, he had some stake in the land of Judea, specifically the temple of Jerusalem. He had uh, jurisdiction over the temple itself. So there's some overlap here. We have, this is a map of Herod Agrippa's, um, like his jurisdiction. He had, uh, he had a, um, authority over the northern section of this, of this territory, not even in Judea, right? It's north of Judea into Syria and those areas. So that's where Herod Agrippa had his territory. But he did have jurisdiction over the temple in Jerusalem. And the reason why Rome did this, it's interesting. It's just political things, right? Um, the Herods came from the line of the Jews, supposedly, because of the, Herod was an Edomite uh, from the, you know, you back all the way up from Esau, right? And so technically in Rome's eyes, they looked at the Herods as a type of Jew. And they said, okay, we want to appease the Jews. And so we're going to put a king in charge of the temple area and in charge of the temple itself. And, and they want to make sure that this king is a Jew by descent, not a Jew from the right line. It's actually a Jew from Esau, not Isaac, but still they looked at these Edomites as a, some sort of Jew. Plus with intermarriage and stuff, there were some things there that they had jurisdiction. So that's how these Herods, they were always, remember Herod the Great said, I'm king of the Jews. And he thought that Jesus was a threat because Jesus was king, right? He was coming in as king. So that's why he killed all the innocents. So it's the same thing. Herod Agrippa II um, is a Jew or an Edomite, and he has temple jurisdiction. So that's why he comes down to commemorate and honor Festus for taking over this new governorship, and he's going to pay his respects. And while he's there now, um, Festus starts bringing up this case of uh, of the Apostle Paul. What's interesting, just to talk a little bit about this map, um, Herod Agrippa II, he is uh, Herod Agrippa I's son. So he's a direct descendant of Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I is who killed James and uh, had Peter arrested, wanting to do the Jews a favor. Same exact thing, right? So he's the son of Herod Agrippa I, who we see in Acts chapter 12, the one who, who died because they got eat, he got eaten by worms. Okay, that's that guy. So he died in 44 AD, and uh, Agrippa II was 17 years old. Too young to, um, to take Take over the whole area of what Herod Agrippa I had. Herod Agrippa I actually had dominion over more land than even Herod the Great. He, he actually had a lot of, of control. Um, Nero, or the, the governor at that time, uh, and the, the emperor at that time, he says, you can't have that much power because you're only 17 years old, so I'm going to give you the northern section. The, he started off in, with the uh, Chalcis territory in, uh, in Syria, and then he slowly started started gaining more, uh, more of a territory in the north. But then again, he has this temple's jurisdiction. So, so Agrippa comes to Jerusalem, 
or comes to Caesarea um, because he's got this temple jurisdiction in Jerusalem and he comes to Caesarea, but notice who is with him. It says King Agrippa and Bernice. Now this is just interesting and it shows the, the debauchery that's going on in Rome because King Agrippa has this, this you know, lover, this not a wife, but this mistress or whatever uh, with him. But notice, if you look at the Herodian family line, notice who this Bernice actually is. You've got Herod Agrippa the first is, is the father of Herod Agrippa the second. But also notice who else is Herod Agrippa's uh, father? Bernice. Bernice is the daughter of Herod Agrippa, and it, it's ma- it makes Bernice and Herod Agrippa II brother and sister. So here you have this incestuous relationship going on between Herod Agrippa II and Bernice, and everywhere where you see Bernice, you see, or everywhere we see Herod Agrippa II, you see Bernice. And so that's what we see over here. King Agrippa and Bernice. We see that come up a, a few times. And again, it just, just debauchery, corruption, um, you know, really terrible things, incest, incestory going on. Um, these are who these people were. So Agrippa, he comes over. And he talks to Festus in Caesarea and they start discussing business. They start discussing, um, you know, the affairs of the city and all these things on his new governorship in Judea. And so in this process, Festus brings up Paul's case, hoping that Herod might have a solution. Because you remember, Herod is, does have jurisdiction over these guys. He's been uh, over them for about 10 years, over the Jews. So he's like, maybe he has some wisdom that I can impart into and I can understand how to deal with these guys because Festus again is in big trouble. And so now he's looking to King Agrippa on how he can get out of this situation. So verse 14, and when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king. So Festus again begins describing from the beginning everything that's happening with the Apostle Paul, describing how uh, as soon as he took office, these guys, these Jews have been incessantly coming against him. So now the next eight verses are, are kind of a recap of what we just read about this trial. So just to take it as a whole, let's just read the next eight verses, verses 14 through 21, and we'll read it out of our Bible here, and we'll kind of comment as we go. So it says, verse 14, when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them, I answered, it's not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before his accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. So he's like, I'm not going to allow him to come down to Jerusalem without really knowing this whole case. It's not the custom of the Romans to do this. So verse 17 Therefore, remember he's talking to Agrippa. He says, when they had come together without any delay, the next day, right, pressuring Festus into this, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and I commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusations against against them of such things as I suppose, but had some questions about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. So again, he's, he's saying this to Agrippa. This is what they're mad at him about. Verse 20, and because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters, wanting to do the Jews a favor because that's what they wanted. Verse 21, but when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. So that's what he relays to Agrippa about this situation. And notice at the end, he says, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. He's like, I can't send him to Caesar until I, I have something that I can write to Caesar about on why I'm even sending this man up there. So he's like, Agrippa, help me. Can you, can you shed any light in this situation? So that's what verse 22, now we'll pick up verse by verse again. Verse 22, then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. 
that was probably like mu- music to Festus's ears. Oh, God, oh, thank, thank you that Agrippa wants to try and help me here because I'm in this really big mess. Maybe he can shed some light. So notice, notice how fast Festus jumps on this. He says, tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So he's like, okay, I think we can make, maybe, maybe Herod can help us out here. So tomorrow you're going to hear him. So notice verse 23. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice, right, there's Bernice following along with him again, had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. So notice this is not a formal trial. This is Festus trying to figure out how he can save his butt by sending Paul up to Nero and not get not get in trouble, right? That's what he's trying to do. And Agrippa, hopefully, this whole thing is kind of built around Paul explaining his case to Agrippa. Now, we don't know for sure, but this is an auditorium is the way it's, it's described. Some commentators think that this is the Roman theater is where they're meeting. And it would make sense. This is, this is uh, Caesarea, um, right? This Roman theater, it still stands today. This, there's a picture of it right here. Um, this is a, a great meeting hall. It's a place for a show. This is where they came to have festivals and, and those types of things. This, is, this Roman theater is where Herod Agrippa I stood up in his shiny suit and per, was pronouncing himself as a god, and God struck him dead, right? That, this is that same Roman theater. So it was a, it was a place that, where they could show off their great great pomp and they could come together in these big festivals and these big gatherings. So Paul, you kind of picture, Paul's not in front of a formal trial now. Paul's in the midst of this arena with thousands of people and the the prominent men of the city, King Agrippa himself is actually there too. And um, and he he gets a chance to preach the gospel. Chapter 26 next week, we're going to see what he says in that time. This is all prepping for that meeting right here. So Festus, he, because he got himself into a lot, of, a lot of trouble here, he's looking for a way out. He gathers all the prominent people of the city to hear Paul's case. Now, this is absolutely astounding, and I, I just thank God that he revealed this to me, because um, as I was going through, I was reading this, and, and a lot of this felt a little dry, and I was, uh, I was praying to God, it's like, you know, reveal to me what is going on here. What, what's happening in, in chapter 25? And I uh, mean, God is so gracious to every time I, I cry for help, he, he brings in revelation. And, and here we start seeing the, some of the, God was showing me the heart of Paul and the heart of, of Festus and what's going on in here and, and what really is happening. And I just, I love it. I can't wait to share this with you. So Luke, he starts describing this ensemble, this this elaborate gathering, and notice how he describes it. It says, so the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, so he starts describing the king down to Paul. Very interesting because normally you would see it would be the lesser you know, listed first as far as like the grand entrance and then King Agrippa as the latter, the main event. Luke words this differently. Luke starts with the most important person there uh, in the world's eyes, King Agrippa, but leading up to who, who really the most important person is, that's the Apostle Paul. I, I just love how, how Luke words this and how he structured this. So he starts with what the world thinks is the most important, but leading to the point of, of what God is actually doing. This is God's providential hand arranging this meeting so the gospel can come forth to these prominent men of the city. This is a, it's a truly fascinating thing. So here, this great pomp, this word pomp is fantasia. It was like where we get the word fantasia or fantasy. So they come in with great fantasy. You know, you can just imagine they're dressed up. They got all their stuff done. I mean, they're, they're coming in. They, they think all eyes are on them and they are coming in with great pomp, Agrippa and Bernice. And then enters in next is uh, the end to the auditorium is the commanders. Now these are the heliarchs. Now remember, Commander Lysias was a heliarch. He was a commander of a thousand. This is the heliarch 
Trois, meaning plural. And we find from history that there was actually five heliarchs in Caesarea, which means that there was 5,000 Roman soldiers in Caesarea. So there's five heliarchs showing up. And the prominent men of the city, right? So you've got the prominent men of the city um, are all coming together. So just kind of picture this show, this fantastic show that, that Festus is arranging, trying to dig himself out of some trouble, present Paul's case to Herod Agrippa, and he's making a big show about it, trying to get this, this all stirred up. And then the most important person in God's eyes enters in. Notice what it says. At Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And now I love this. Everyone has gathered together to hear something great from Festus. So here's something great about Herod Agrippa. All the great prominent men of the city have come in and they've all come for one person. Little did they know what they were about ready to hear. Little did they know who they were actually coming to see, that the God of the universe was providentially arranging this so that his ambassador, Jesus Christ, the king of the universe, could be presenting his ambassador, his servant. And it says Festus commands Paul to be brought in. Somebody completely different than everybody else that's there. And I, I just love just thinking about this. Here, Paul, probably dirty and in chains, and in ragged clothes after being in prison for two years. And he comes and stands in the middle of this arena with everybody else in their great pomp. And all eyes are now come to this apostle Paul. So God is now arranging this, arranging this meeting. Little did Festus know he was arranging this too. He was arranging this out of desperation, but little did he know he was arranging a gospel meeting to, to take place in front of people who normally wouldn't hear the gospel. So all eyes are on this lowly, meek man, this man who is the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul. But to the world, he doesn't come with great pomp or royal apparel. He comes as a humble, lowly servant to proclaim the good news from the king of the universe. This is what God is arranging here. So this is God's faithful ambassador. And I was just seeing this, that God is bringing his ambassador, his, the king of the universe is bringing the ambassador for the good news, for the message that all would, would hear, right? This is what's bring, being brought in. So God is bringing in his royal ambassador. To the world, you had all these royal uh, uh, people in royal apparel, but God looks at Paul as his royal ambassador, not dressed in royal pomp, but in ragged clothes and a humble servant. I just was getting that picture as God was like giving me this vision, this understanding of what's truly going on behind the scenes. It's God, God's providence orchestrating and gathering all these events so that the gospel can be presented to the world, not just here in Caesarea, but this is going to go to the world. It's going to go to Rome itself. But one thing that happens, and this is, this is astounding, what happens in the heart of Festus here, as we're going to see in these next few verses. Um, before Paul begins to speak, Festus stands up before all of these men publicly and confesses something absolutely astounding. Um, listen to what Festus actually says. We're going to read, let's read from verses 24 through 27. Because you think about it, Festus knew he made a mistake. Festus knew that this, he should have just put, uh, just co um, commanded that uh, Paul was innocent and be been done with it. So he knew he made, he made a mistake and, and now he knows it's too late because he's already decreed from his judgment seat that Paul was going to go appeal to Caesar. So now he has to live with that mistake and he starts pouring out his heart. This is Festus pouring out his heart publicly to King Agrippa and everybody else that's around him. Notice what he says in verse 24 and following. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us. So he's talking to everybody publicly. I don't know how many people are there, probably thousands. And they're all prominent men of the city. And notice what, what he starts saying. King Agrippa and all the men who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. So he knows that the Jews want to kill him. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. You know, he says, so he says, this, these, these guys pressured me into this. I'm declaring him innocent in front of all of you. 
but I've already pronounced that he can come up and appeal to Caesar. And so he says, he says, now I decided to send him verse 26, but I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you and especially before you King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. Isn't that kind of an amazing thing, an amazing confession of humility that Festus would say that before all the prominent men of the city? I think that's pretty astounding. And I think the reason he's saying that is because the spirit of God is convicting him. And he's just saying this, of course, Festus is not a Christian, but he's just feeling this massive amount of conviction. And he's publicly confessing that I made a mistake and I need help getting out of it. I got nothing to write to my Lord Caesar. I can't send him up to Nero. I'm hoping King Agrippa that after you hear this man, there might be something that we can write about. I think that's pretty amazing that a man in, uh, in, of Festus's caliber um, and, and of his, of his uh, status would say such a thing as that. So I want to bring you back on a couple things here in verse 25. Notice what Festus says, and this is why he's so scared. It, it says that he himself had appealed to Augustus. Now, this Augustus was not um, a name. It was a title and actually not really even a title. It's more of a description of who these Caesars are. And so this is how he viewed Nero. This word Augustus in the Greek is sebastos. It means the one we stand in awe of and worship. <laughs> so Festus says, uh, he hasn't, he hasn't committed, committed anything deserving of death. I don't have anything to write concerning him, but he's appealed to our God. He's appealed to the one we stand in awe of and worship. That's what he's saying to everybody, right? Festus obviously is not a Christian. Um, and he's saying that Nero is his God. He's the one that we worship. And I'm scared because I can't send him up to our God, the one we stand in awe of and worship without having something to write. Notice verse 26. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord. Now this word Lord is the word Kyrios. It's the same word that we call Jesus as Lord. He looked at Nero as his Lord, as his God. Now, these Romans had a very low perspective of gods. Obviously, they had thousands of them, right? And these Nero, these, um, these Caesars looked at themselves as gods. But still, it just shows Festus is in huge desperation, saying that the one who I look to, to and serve... I can't send Paul up there because I'm going to be in trouble if I do. Now, I, just a small note about this word Kyrios and how the Caesars demanded that, that everybody call them Lord. Many Christians in the first century and the second century died because they refused to call Caesar Lord, right? They would say Jesus is Lord and they would denounce Caesar as Lord. And many Christians died um, uh, because of that. I just wanted to mention that to you. But here, Festus, obviously not a Christian, pronouncing Nero as his Lord, as his, as his one he stands in awe of and worships. So Festus is putting his hope in some off chance, hopefully that Agrippa can hear the words of Paul and they can come up with something that they can send to Nero uh, to explain why he's being sent up there. So notice what it says in verse 26. I want to read this again because this is so, I think this is so fun and, and God is just revealing this to me. Notice what it says in verse 26. He says, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I, have, therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. Festus needs something to be written about the Apostle Paul to bring up to Nero. I think right here, is when Luke gets the idea from, prompted by the Holy Spirit to go up to Festus after this and say, you know what, Festus? You want something to write to bring up to Nero? And you want something to write about the Apostle Paul? I can give you something to write. In fact, I can tell you what this whole story is about. And I'll write something to Nero and I'll explain what this whole thing is about. I'll write the book, of, the book of Luke and I'll write the book of Acts and I'll send it with Paul so that you can explain to your Lord what's going on. Isn't that amazing? I think that's what's happening right here. I think that this is now 
Luke and Paul, this, what, he, what Festus wants to write, this is now God making, providentially making it so that Paul can write the book of Acts. So Luke can write the book of Acts and he can bring the gospel, the, the true story. Festus is, is yearning and in desperation of something to write to bring to Nero. God gives him something and he brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to Nero. Isn't that so beautiful? I, I just, I, God was revealing that to me. And I just, I think this is what prompts Luke to write what we're studying. This is why I believe, I, you've heard me from the very beginning saying that the book of Luke and the book of Acts were trial documents for Paul. And, and I, it's, I, I, I believe that with all my heart. I think this is the point that, that he, he, Luke has already been writing and journaling and, and having interviews and been writing about all these occasions. Now the Holy Spirit drops it in him and says, write this. This is now what I want you to write. These are now his trial documents. And it's the fact that now God is providentially, notice this, God's providentially working and his hand is moving on wicked hearts with Nero and Festus and Agrippa and all these wicked hearts. But he's moving in this so that they would be acceptance, accepting of the written account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I just think that is so fun seeing that come about in this. So next week, that ends the chapter 25. So next week, we're going to see Paul's defense again, and we're going to see how that's going to start launching into the fact that Paul now can be brought to Rome. Praise God. Isn't that good? Oh, man, let's just give God glory. Man, just <laughs> Praise God that God will use dishonorable vessels. He will use these circumstances. He will use these things so the gospel can come to the world. That's how good our God is. Our God is so good. He wants the gospel. He wants his message of good news brought to the whole world, not just to a few select people, but to the whole world. And all who would believe in him would have eternal life. Praise God. All right. Well, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Dalton, you want to sing? Okay. We're going to sing um, promises. I thought just this would be fun, just how faithful God is to his promises. All right. Let's go ahead and stand up and let's worship. Oh, praise God. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are so faithful. Yeah, even when we were dead in our sins and we were, we were sinners, Christ died for us, that you are so faithful to your word that you sent your son and that you sent your life that we might have life everlasting. And here we see in the book of Acts that you are so faithful to your word. You're so faithful to send your ambassadors, to send those who would proclaim the word that, that so that all who would hear it and believe might be saved. Father, let that be each and every one of us here, that you might look down on us as your faithful ambassadors, that we would humble ourselves to you, that we would not be prideful and haughty and come in great pomp, but that we would humble ourselves before the foot of the cross, that we would humble ourselves before you, King Jesus, and that we might be found worthy to be an ambassador for you, an ambassador to the King, an ambassador to salvation and life with you. Father, I thank you for these words. I thank you that you worked with the Apostle Paul and Luke, that we might have this book of Acts, that we might have these words of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that just how we see that you're working with kings and governors and all these prominent men of the city. And yet the one who has the most important message is your humble servant. So Father, we, we just come to you um, saying, laying down our life that we Profess that we are your humble servant. Use us, send us, send us just like you're doing with Brother Randy to Uganda. Send us to our next door neighbors. Send us to the people that you would have. Send us to, to those people that they might hear your word. And I thank you, Father, that those who are here are faithful to you. You were faithful to your word, that you would edify us, that you would build us up and equip us and fill us with your spirit to go forth and proclaim the gospel that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so I thank you, Father, for that. I thank you for this time that we've had to gather together to worship you and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give God praise. All right. Oh, God is so good, so good. So um, let's go ahead and gather into our groups to pray. And uh, we just thank God for his goodness, right? All right. If I don't see you, we'll see you next week as we continue our book of Acts.